Good evening. My name is Richard Plum, and I have the privilege of being the Executive Vice President and Provost at the University of St. Thomas. And on behalf of the university community and the Science and Technology Network, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our students, our faculty, our staff, and friends of the university. Ninety years ago, the nation's attention was drawn to us to the small town of Dayton, Tennessee. The state of Tennessee versus John Thomas Scopes, the so-called Scopes Monkey Trial, was a benchmark legal case that drew attention to how Americans understood the creator, the world, and themselves. It was the first pitched legal battle in a controversy that still lingers today. Tonight's presentation exemplifies something that the University of St. Thomas's, St. Thomas encourages, an interdisciplinary search for the truth. We have two speakers tonight, one from the Department of Philosophy and the other from the Department of Communication and Journalism. And our moderator for this evening is from the Department of Theology. Tonight's event is being co-sponsored by the Departments of Philosophy, Communication and Journalism, and Theology, as well as the Murphy Institute and the Science and Technology Network. I'd like to call upon our moderator for the evening, uh, Professor Philip Rolick, who will introduce our speakers tonight. Phil? Let me introduce our first speaker, Professor Ken Kemp. Ken Kemp has a master's degree in the history and philosophy of science and a PhD in philosophy from the University of Notre Dame. He also has degrees in linguistics from Georgetown University and the University of Texas at Austin and a degree in liberal education from St. John's College. He served eight years on active duty, four in the U.S. Army and four in the U.S. Air Force. He has taught at the United States Air Force Academy at Texas A&M University, and at the Catholic University of Lublin in Poland. He has been a member of the University of St. Thomas Philosophy Department since 1989. In addition to teaching courses on campus, Professor Kemp has played an important role in developing connections between St. Thomas and institutions in several Central European countries, in particular Poland, Ukraine, Belarus, and Lithuania. Over the course of his work on this project, some 200 students have had an opportunity to study abroad in that region. In his scholarship, he has translated several Polish works, including Archbishop Joseph Szczyzinski's God and Evolution, and his own work in the area of science and religion includes articles such as, quote, science, theology, and monogenesis, end quote, uh, scientific Method and the Appeal to Supernatural Agency, a Christian Case for Modest Methodological Naturalism, Faith as a Virtue in Theology, Philosophy, and Natural Science, The Possibility of Conflict Between Science and Christian Theology, and With Friends Like Those, Who Needs Enemies? How Aggressive Atheism Impedes the Acceptance of Evolutionary Biology. He has recently completed a book manuscript entitled the War That Never Was, Christian Theology and Evolution. And he is now at work on a book-length history of Catholic evolutionism and another book entitled Let the Earth Bring Forth Living Things, a Catholic account of the Creator God and his evolving cosmos. Would you please join me in welcoming Professor Ken Kemp. Okay, uh, the cl in the closing scene of The Man Who Shot Liberty Valens, a newspaperman says, when the legend becomes fact, print the legend. Someday we can talk about whether that might ever be good advice, but on that day, the biggest challenge to the maxim will be the story of the Scopes trial. In the years since the trial, distorted versions of what happened in Dayton have become exhibit A for one of the persistent myths of contemporary secularism, namely the, the idea that there's a long-running war between science and religion. 
No historian thinks that that warfare myth correctly characterizes the relationship between these two great aspects of human culture. It nevertheless remains a trope available not only to members of the League of Militant Atheists on the warpath, but to any lazy journalist in search of a lead. It's now familiar chiefly through the dramatic efforts of Jerome Lawrence and Robert E. Lee, in whose 1955 play, Inherit the Wind, a courageous school teacher is persecuted for teaching evolution in his classroom by the religious fanatics who inhabit the Bible Belt. The incident so understood has become, in the words of liberal journalist Joseph Wood Crutch, who covered the trial for the nation, part of the folklore of liberalism. Tonight I want to do three things. Tell a story of what really happened at Dayton, <clears throat> to identify the real antagonists, and to say a few words about why this matters today. So, let me begin with the history of the trial itself. What really happened at Dayton? The case was, in actual fact, a test case, among whose initiators one can distinguish two very different, though not incompatible, motives. Some of those who took part in setting the case up were opposed to Tennessee's new anti-evolution law and wanted to challenge its constitutionality. Others were civic boosters who hoped that hosting the case would bring some notice to a city facing hard economic times. The case originated in three events. The first was passage of the Butler Act early in 1925. Former and part-time legislator John Washington Butler, concerned that teaching students that man evolved from animals caused them to lose their religion, wrote and Tennessee enacted a bill making it unlawful for any teacher in the public schools to teach any theory that denies a story of the divine creation of man as taught in the Bible and the teaching instead that man has descended from a lower order of animals. The second event was a decision by the American Civil Liberties Union to challenge the constitutionality of the law. To do this, it needed to find someone with standing to bring the matter into the courts. A school teacher would be best suited for that role, so the union published in the newspapers of Tennessee a notice announcing, we're looking for a Tennessee teacher who's willing to accept our services in testing this law in the courts. Our lawyers think a friendly test case can be arranged without costing a teacher his or her job. Distinguished counsel have volunteered their services. All we need now is a willing client. The third was the response to that announcement by George Rapelier, a young New Yorker with a doctorate in chemical engineering, then working in Dayton. Rapelier saw the announcement in the Chattanooga Times just a few days after Dayton's school year had ended. The next day, he went to work to secure the trial for Dayton. He first succeeded in persuading some of his fellow citizens, including F.E. Robinson, chairman of the school board, and Walter White, superintendent of schools, that hosting a trial would be good for the town. Some of those citizens favored the law. Rapelier did not. Both sides, however, liked the idea of trying a case in Dayton. So Rapoulier went in search of a teacher willing to stand as defendant. The logical choice would have been the biology teacher, W.F. Ferguson. But Ferguson, who was also principal of the school, had a family to support and decided not to get involved. Second choice was John T. Scopes, who just finished his first year teaching physics and mathematics at the high school but who had substituted for Ferguson during that teacher's illness. Scopes was invited to meet, there he is, uh, with Rapelier and the others at Robinson's Drugstore, which served as a kind of a social center for the town. Rapelier began by asking Scopes whether it was possible to teach biology without teaching evolution. Scopes said it was not, and to make his point, pulled off the shelf, Robinson's Drugstore sold textbooks on the side, pulled off the shelf a copy of George William Hunter's Civic Biology, Oops. the state-mandated textbook. The book placed man in the evolutionary series along with all other organisms, although Hunter emphasized that man is separated mentally by a wide gap from other animals. Would Scopes be willing to challenge the law? Scopes was not certain that he had actually taught the passages that discussed evolution. But since he'd used Hunter to help the students review for their examinations, 
all present thought that a case against him could be made. Stopes, who had been a student at the University of Kentucky just three years before when University President Frank McVeigh had led the successful fight against the Bryan Law in that state, consented. If, he said, you can prove that I've taught evolution, that I qualify as a defendant. Robinson then called the city desk of the Chattanooga Times. This is Effie Robinson in Dayton. I'm chairman of the school board here. We've just arrested a man for teaching evolution, he said. Then Scopes went off to finish the tennis game that had been interrupted by the invitation to come on down to the drugstore. Although local lawyers could have handled the prosecution of the case, the ACLU had already offered to provide lawyers for the defense. Several other lawyers nevertheless quickly became involved in the case. Their identities, their concerns, and their motives reveal much about the nature of what happened to Dayton. The goal of the city being to host an event that would attract some notice, it was perhaps only natural that the prosecution would invite William Jennings Bryan uh, to come to their assistance, which he promptly agreed to do. Bryan, now the great commoner rather than the boy orator of the Platte, had been active in Democratic Party politics since his election to Congress in 1890. Three times nominated by his party for the presidency, Secretary of State in the Wilson administration until Wilson's bellicose response to the sink of the Lusitania precipitated his resignation, Bryan had been a tireless advocate for many of the progressive causes of his day, Philippine independence, the direct election of senators, women's suffrage, income tax, and legislation by initiative and referendum. He had also been a popular speaker on the Chautauqua circuit. The anti-evolution crusade of the 1920s, which he was largely, though not exclusively, responsible for launching, was to be his last campaign. Bryan's announcement that he would participate in the prosecution prompted Clarence Darrow to volunteer for the defense. Darrow had gained national fame representing controversial defendants in at least two crimes of the century already, in a century not yet three decades old. He came to Dayton within a year of representing Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb, two brilliant and rich Chicago college students who killed a young neighbor in an unsuccessful attempt to prove that they could commit a perfect crime. Darrow's denial of the doctrine of free will in his attempt to save Leopold and Loeb from the electric chair and his public defense of agnosticism in other contexts had gained him as much notoriety in some circles as he had gained renown in others. Scopes was the only case in which Darrow ever volunteered his services. The ACLU would never have chosen Darrow, whose iconoclastic views on religion and human psychology would have distracted from the narrow constitutional focus that the Union preferred. But Scopes was, defended, was the defendant, so the choice was his. Representing the ACLU, then, was Arthur Garfield Hayes, one of its founders. Hayes' later career provides his character note. He defended the right of workers to organize unions and the right of Henry Ford to distribute anti-union literature to his workers. He traveled to Berlin on behalf of the defendants in the Reichstag trial, even though he was himself Jewish, and defended the right of the pro-Nazi German-American Bund to possess anti-Semitic literature. His view of the case was that it was a battle between two definite types of mind, the rigid, orthodox, unyielding, narrow, conventional mind, and the broad, liberal, critical, cynical, and tolerant mind. The city welcomed all these men. Brian was cheered when he spoke at the trial, but defense lawyers were given even more spirited applause when they spoke. Crutch later wrote, though ostensibly at least all on the side of the prosecution, many of the businessmen were finally delighted that their town was going to be put on the map as a place where one of the greatest questions of the day would be debated by world-famous visitors. The trial itself, however, was not quite all that its supporters had hoped it would be. The defense had wanted to present expert testimony in defense of the theory of evolution itself and against the idea that it was in conflict with the Bible. But the judge ruled that such testimony was not relevant to the legal question that the court was supposed to decide. The only point of dramatic in interest came when Judge John T. Ralston, in a momentary lapse of judgment, and despite the vehement protests of state's attorney Thomas Stewart, let Darrow and Bryan persuade him to allow Darrow to take expert testimony in the Bible. From Brian. Real expert testimony being excluded, the defense had little left to do. Ralston, having rejected the defense's challenge to the constitutionality of the act, a conviction was necessary to the attainment of the defense's larger goals. The New York World 
had been exaggerating only slightly when before the trial it had written, upon Darrow is placed the responsibility of losing the case. Should Scopes be acquitted, all plans for testing the law in the Supreme Courts would have been for nothing. It would be necessary then to obtain a new defendant and lose his case. Darrow told the jury that, on the evidence provided, they had no choice but to find the defendant guilty. After nine minutes of deliberation, the jury did what the evidence required that they do. The Tennessee Supreme Court rejected the challenge to the law but threw out Scopes' conviction on a technicality, and that brought the legal aspect of the case to an end. Let's talk a little about science, religion, and the Scopes trial. Does this case show us anything about the relation between science and religion? Is it, for example, a case of religion impeding the advance of science? Against that charge, I want to make two points. The first is that Bryant cannot be seen as representative of religion, and Darrow certainly cannot be seen as representative of science. The second is that the fault for the confrontation between evolutionism and anti-evolutionism does not lie all on the side of the anti-evolutionists. Although Bryan and his allies had religious motives, they cannot be identified with religion, not even with conservative Protestantism. The battle over Bryan laws was not one between science and religion, but one in which there were conservative Protestants on both sides of the issue. While Presbyterian Bryan led the anti-evolution campaign, John Gresham Machen, one of conservative Presbyterianism's leading theologians, turned down Bryan's invitation to testify for the prosecution at Dayton. And Hay Watson Smith, pastor of Little Rock's Second Presbyterian Church, worked and preached against passive, passage of a Bryan law in his state. While Baptists William Bell Riley and J.W. Porter promoted Bryan laws, Edgar Young Mullins, president of the Southern Baptist Convention, worked against them. While it was a primitive Baptist, John Washington Butler, who wrote Tennessee's anti-evolution law, it was another primitive Baptist, Brian, or, sorry, Bryce Condiff, who cast the deciding vote against Kentucky's in that state's House of Representatives. To the extent that the controversy between the proponents of the Bryan Laws and their critics is over whether the school curriculum could address the origins of man without mentioning the human soul then, offensive to scientific ears as it may be to say so, the controversy was not over a purely scientific thesis. For those who hold a materialist anthropology, the question of the origins of man will be no less a scientific question than is the question of the origins of butterflies and slime mold. But the soundness of the materialist anthropology, which that answer presupposes, is not itself a scientific question. For anyone whose anthropology includes a thesis that man has an immaterial soul, the origin of which cannot be established by scientific methods, a complete account of the origin of man, remember that that's all that the Bryan Law touched, would be beyond the reach of science. To the extent that the drama at Dayton was centered on Darrow, the other side of the, of the trial cannot fairly be characterized as science. Darrow came to Dayton not as a student of science, as, as a student of science, but as village atheist. He wrote later that my object and my only object was to focus the attention of the country on the program of Mr. Bryan and the other fundamentalists in America. I knew that education was in danger from religious fanaticism. Darrow's views had nothing in particular to do with to do with science and everything to do with philosophical naturalism, the impossibility of miracles, and secularist politics, the inappropriateness of opening court with a prayer. The faults on the evolutionist side cannot be all cannot all be ascribed to Darrow. Howard K. Beale, although generally on the evolutionist side of the question, acknowledged in a 1933 study of the freedom of American teachers that one basic cause of fundamentalist attacks on the schools is the fact that hundreds of poorly trained teachers of science with a desire to shock people with their new information and no adequate training on their subject have been sent out into the schools with uh, exactly this attitude that science is a body of indisputably proved facts. Next, uh, Scopes and politics. What's the real conflict to Dayton? I think there's another aspect of the Scopes trial that repays notice. The struggle between Bryan's commitment to majority rule and the ACLU's libertarianism. Bryan was a committed, though not absolute majoritarian. His confidence in the ultimate good judgment of the people is all the more admirable, I think, in a man three times defeated in a race for the presidency. His political principles can be drawn from two passages found in his public addresses. 
On the basis of his majoritarianism, he argued that the hand that writes the paycheck rules the school. His second principle was based not on majoritarianism, but on fairness. If the Bible cannot be defended in the schools, it should not be attacked, either directly or under guise of philosophy or science. Walter Lippmann, who opposed the laws, recognized the importance of this principle and gave Bryan his Jeffersonian due. Lippmann wrote, Bryan asked whether, if it's wrong to compel people to support a creed they disbelieve, it's not also wrong to compel them to support teaching which impugns a creed in which they do believe. Jefferson had insisted in his bill for establishing religious freedom in 1779 that the people should not have to pay for the teaching of Anglicanism. Bryan asked why they should be made to pay for the teaching of agnosticism. Now, on the other side, the ACLU, which had formed a committee on academic freedom in 1924, articulated its principles as follows. There should be no legislative interference whatever with the school curriculum. The preparation of the curriculum should be left entirely in the hands of professional educators. And, they said, teachers should be permitted the same freedom of expression inside the classroom as is demanded by citizens outside the classroom. The free exercise of this right should not be interfered with by the authorities of the institutions which employ them. That second principle has not in subsequent years been maintained by anti-anti-evolutionists. In 1987, the ACLU joined the new Lenox, Illinois School District in defending the district's right to forbid its teacher, Ray Webster, from teaching anti-evolutionism in the classroom, a view which prevailed at court. Perhaps even in 1924, its operative principle was not free speech for teachers, but the normative character of the scientific consensus, despite both popular reservations and the beliefs of individual teachers. That at least seems to have been the view of the editors of the New York World, which proposed the doctrine of educational independence from untrammeled chance majorities analogous to the independence of the judiciary. But they acknowledged that they were by no means clear just what that doctrine meant or just how you'd work it out. In this confrontation, there's no necessary connection to science or religion. The same struggle between school teachers' right to say whatever they think in the classroom and citizens' right to set limits to what the teachers they hire may say was already occurring in other contexts. Contemporary ACLU statements refer to a diffuse array of educational practices that the union grouped under the heading compulsory patriotism. There is, to be sure, a second political confrontation underlying the Bryan Laws, one between two different views of what constitutes improper, or at least un-American, government education policy on matters touching religion. Defenders of the law argued they were necessary to ensure government neutrality on religious issues. A political advertisement in the Arkansas Gazette, as voters in that state faced a referendum on the Bryan Law, said simply, it doesn't seek to help the church. It simply forbids the state attacking the church by having evolution taught in the schools at taxpayers' expense. Their opponents argue that laws constituted impermissible deference to, particular, to a particular set of religious beliefs. So Maynard Shipley complained that fundamentalist religious dogmas are being set up as a part of freedom of teaching in our legally secular schools. Tennessee's Butler Act was particularly vulnerable to Shipley's objection as it made specific reference to the Bible. The Bryan Laws in Mississippi and Arkansas, enacted shortly after Tennessee's, uh, avoided that defect. So, what's the significance of all this? I think we can learn from a careful look at the Stokes trial two things. First, that the warfare thesis distorts history. The idea that there is a war between science and religion causes us to misunderstand history. I think it causes us not to look at the things I was just talking about, but something else in, instead. There was, a, there was a war, of course, between evolutionists and anti-evolutionists, which continued into the 1920s, not only in society at large, but in the conservative Christian churches. There was also a war between militant atheists wearing laboratory coats as a kind of camouflage, and Christianity. Neither of these, however, can be construed as a war between science and religion. Second, the unwillingness to accommodate those with whom we disagree leads to deepen and prolonged social conflict. Brian's anti-evolutionism was less radical than the anti-evolutionism of today. 
He sought to keep evolutionary anthropogenesis out of the public schools. Today's anti-evolutionism has broadened into a comprehensive attack on contemporary evolutionary biology as a whole, or at least uh, on natural selection in the case of intelligent design theory and uh, on all of the historical sciences, so evolutionary cosmology and so on as well in the case of creation science. The Butler Act that was a direct object of Scope's challenge had its defects as a piece of legislation, but we should acknowledge as too much contemporary discourse does not, both the complexity of the issue and the importance of doing our best to accommodate religious dissenters in our community, even when we're certain that they're mistaken. So, thank you. Let me now introduce our second speaker, Mark, uh, Professor Mark Nugio, who is Professor of Communication and Journalism at St. Thomas and the Director of the St. Thomas Office for Mission. Professor Nugio is the author of, or co-author of six books, including a forthcoming Cultural History of the Canoe in North America, with a foreword written by John McPhee. In 2001, he won a Minnesota Book Award for his uh, Views on the Mississippi, the Photographs of Henry Peter Bossie, University of Minnesota Press. In 2008, his book, The Environment and the Press, From Adventure Writing to Advocacy with Northwestern University Press, won the James Tankard Award from the Association for Education in Journalism and Mass Communication. Professor Nugio has also received top honors from the Society of Professional Journalists and the Society of Environmental Journalists. In 2013, he was chosen as Professor of the Year at St. Thomas. Would you please join me in welcoming Professor Mark Nugio. Here we go. I want the pointer. I'm ready. Everybody else good? Good. Well, as Ken said, I represent all the lazy journalists. And it's a heavy burden because there's a lot of us. And so, shall we get on with the distortion? Let's do that. So, I'm going to talk about the Scopes trial in relation to the media coverage of the Scopes trial. So, I'm going to leave you with two ideas, if you can leave here with two ideas. One is related to the history of radio, that the Scopes trial was the first trial to be broadcast live on the radio as one of the media trials of the century. Two is because of the hubbub surrounding both the Scopes trial and other trials that got heavy media attention that the American Bar Association was successful in writing legislation called Canon 35, Canon 35, which barred cameras from the courtroom. Those two things. If you can remember those two things, you're going to be golden. So. Media trials of the century. So what you're going to notice is, as I go through a few of these, that as the centuries get more recent, there are more media forms, and then there are therefore more media trials. So in the 18th century, there's really only a couple of media trials. One was, and this is just in the United States, John Peter Zenger in the colonial times, the trial of John Zenger, who was a printer, attracted media attention. The result of the Zenger trial was truth was established as a defense in a courtroom. Second media trial of the 17th century, you all know about the Boston Massacre, and one of the sparks that encouraged the revolution from King George and England. 
Now, if we move to the next century, we got a few more trials, a few more media trials, because now we have the advent of more media. We've got daily newspapers and magazines, which we did not have at all in the 18th century. Now you've got more media outlets. So we've got John Brown, whose body, as far as we know, might still be lying a molding in the grave. You know who John Brown was. We've got the Haymarket Riots, which introduced the nation to Clarence Darrow, his first big defense case. And Ken has talked about Darrow's personal history as an attorney. He's involved in three media trials of the century, which is pretty good if you're an attorney. And then we've got the case in 1893 of Lizzie Borden, who allegedly killed her parents with an ax. Lizzie Borden took an ax, gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41, that kind of thing. That lends itself to media coverage, all right? It's got that certain rhyming quality. And then we get to the 20th century, previous century to our own, and there are lots of media trials of the century because now we've got more media. We've got radio at the beginning of the century. We've got recorded music. We've got film. We were soon to have television. But prior to the Scopes trial, we've got some media trials of the century. We've got the trial of Harry K. Thaw in the case of the girl in the red velvet swing. The girl in the red velvet swing was played by Joan Collins in the movie. There she is. Outlandishly racy trial. We've got the Chicago Black Sox World Series fixing trial of 1921. Say it ain't so, Joe. Shoeless Joe Jackson. We've got Leopold and Loeb trying to commit and failing to commit the perfect crime, as Ken has touched on with Darrow in that case as well. And then we've got Scopes, 1925. So here we are in Dayton, Tennessee. Now I've got to introduce media here in Dayton, Tennessee. So the problem in Dayton, Tennessee was they had no radio station. Television wasn't invented yet. In fact, in the entire state of Tennessee, they had no radio. At least none that could handle a broadcast like this. Tennessee's most famous radio station then and now, I would argue, was WSM in Nashville. Anybody know? What WSM was famous for broadcasting then and now? We have a winner here, ladies and gentlemen. The Grand Old Opry. The Grand Old Opry. WSM, do you know what it stands for? The initials. Bonus points for that. We serve millions because the owner was an insurance salesman. And we serve millions was WSM, Grand Old Opry then and now. Grand Old Opry on WSM. WSM did not go on the air until October of 1925, until a few months after the Scopes trial was over. Now, they would have had the electronic capability of broadcasting the trial, but they weren't ready yet. They were a few months behind. And so it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Instead, We get Dayton, Tennessee, and that's, by the way, the location of Dayton, which is actually in the southeastern corner of the state near the Appalachian Mountains. So they had a weekly paper, and that was about it. That was about it for the Dayton media. Now, here we have Scopes and Rappelier, the, the two, two of the principal characters in, in the case. And when I look at this, I see Rappelier as a fellow who had a clear understanding of how to promote himself and his city and how to manipulate the media for the promotion of the city of Dayton. And he did a good job of it. He knew what he was doing when he went in. I also look at this picture and I see scopes and I'm thinking, I wonder what the deal is with the Harry Potter glasses. Coincidence? Maybe not. In any event, 
these guys were already media darlings, which is a phrase we use often in journalism. They attract media attention just by being. It's a little bit like the President of the United States, in the sense, and Brian wanted to be President, right? That everything the President does is newsworthy, even when he doesn't do anything. President's on vacation, newsworthy. President didn't do anything today, newsworthy. President Obama didn't do anything today. Film at 11, that kind of thing. These guys were like that. They attracted attention just based on who they were. And it was fortunate for Rappelier and the others in Dayton who staged this trial that they got these two attorneys if their goal was to get attention to the city, which it was, which was their goal. One of the exchanges that I like the best in this, and I don't know why I like this, but I do, was the idea that Cain, you know, had killed Abel, but yet Cain had reproduced, and yet how, what happened to... And so they were attempting to negotiate their way through the Bible and the Old Testament, and this was an example of the kind of to and fro that went on that's irresistible to any journalist who would be there. How could you not write this down and include it in your story? And then if you had Legos, you could illustrate it. But Legos actually weren't invented just yet. Now, here's the highest profile print journalist who covered the trial, H.L. Mencken from the Baltimore Sun, who was also a founder of the magazine called The American Mercury, which was in existence by this time. Mencken is the journalist who came up with the quote, the monkey trial. That was his phrase. And he covered all the trial. And his newspaper, the Baltimore Sun, actually paid Scopes' bail to get him out of the pokey. And then, as Ken and I were discussing earlier, it's likely that the newspaper also paid his fine when he was found guilty. That probably wouldn't happen today because of our more sophisticated, or what we like to think of as a more sophisticated conflict of interest understanding. But the Baltimore Sun and Mencken knew a good story when they saw it, and they were happy to participate in that way by paying the bail. Now, in 1925, Mencken is 45 years old. He was called the Sage of Baltimore, and he wrote something every day, and he was highly critical of Bryant, mocked the people of Tennessee, was often very satirical, often very biting, and just not very nice. Just not very nice, but everybody read him. He was syndicated. And that means that his paper's columns were distributed across the country in papers everywhere, so his readership extended far beyond Baltimore. And he was in the American Mercury magazine, which extended his reach even further. So he was the most significant of the print journalists who were there, but there were 200 print journalists there, including two from London. So that's a lot. That's another thing that defines a media trial of the century is how many. Well, in this case, 200 is a lot. By the way, Ken talked about the movie, the play in the movie Inherit the Wind. Gene Kelly played, a little bit of trivia for you, Gene Kelly plays Mencken in the movie. So, um, but our main protagonist here is WGN Radio in Chicago. WGN Radio in Chicago broadcasts the trial live. It's the first live broadcast of criminal proceedings anywhere, ever. And it was WGN in Chicago. Now you might think to yourself, I'm geographically savvy. Chicago's a long way from Dayton, 600 miles or more. So they had logistical things to work out. But work them out, they did. And WGN stands for, by the way, world's greatest newspaper. Because it was owned by the Chicago Tribune and Colonel McCormick. And Colonel McCormick also understood, like Rappelier, about self-promotion. WGN uh, went on the air originally in 1922 the year after the first radio station broadcast in the United States, which was 1921 to Pittsburgh. 1922, Chicago gets radio, uh, but it was not called WGN at that time. It was uh, WDAP, 
Colonel McCormick saw the opportunity, bought the station two years later, renamed it WGN, World's Greatest Newspaper, and put his money behind it. And he has a lot, had a lot of money. Some of you have probably been to McCormick Place in Chicago. In any event, WGN, first on the air, as I say, in 1924, is what we call 50,000 watt clear channel station. That means nobody else broadcasts on that frequency in the United States. They have it to themselves, so there's less interference. 50,000 watts at the time was the strongest frequency you could have. So on a clear day from Chicago, you could get it in Minnesota, Iowa, the Dakotas, as far as Montana, East Coast, as long as the mountains weren't in the way, you could hear WGN. It broadcast a long way. It was the only radio station to have, was and is the only radio station on the AM dial to have 720 as their frequency. That was part of the way this is set up. Now, we are a long ways from FM radio. AM radio was the only option there. FM is still to come, so keep that in mind as well. Now, their first attempt at broadcasting from the trial failed. They set up on Friday, July 10th, and they flipped the switch, and they got nothing. This was during jury selection, so it wasn't a huge part of the trial, except as Ken said, everybody wanted to be on the jury. So there's a lot of excitement, but they couldn't get it to work. They couldn't get it to work. Fortunately, it was a Friday, so they had the whole weekend to fix it. So they did not broadcast on the first day of the trial, which was mostly just jury selection. They had Saturday and Sunday to fix it. By Monday, they're good to go. They're up and running by Monday. Now, they had to run 600 miles of cable, which is a lot, in addition to renting lines from AT&T, the phone company, Monopoly at the time. So they used both AT&T lines and ran their own cable from Chicago to Tennessee to broadcast it. And the price to them was roughly $1,000 a day paid to AT&T. That's what they paid AT&T to rent the lines. That's how it went. Now, they were experienced at broadcasting live events. It's not like this was the first live event ever broadcast, and I've seen that mistake made in some of the literature. Well, they'll say, a journalism history text might say, first live broadcast of anything was the Scopes trial. That's false. WGN had experienced broadcasting live events, mostly sports. So you can see here, they had already done the Indy 500, that year, they had done the college football, they had done the Kentucky Derby, they had done the presidential elections, debates. And so they were experienced at live broadcasts. They knew what they were doing. But Dayton was so far away, farther than any place it ever broadcast from, that it presented particular challenges just based on the distance, right? Now, They could have broadcast the Leopold and Loeb trial in Chicago, which was in Chicago right across the street from them, but they passed on it. They weren't sure at that time whether they could do it, and they weren't sure they could convince the judge that it would be okay. But in Tennessee, they convinced the judge that it would be okay. The judge agreed, and they entered into agreement with the court to do it. So the judge actually rearranged the courtroom around the microphones so everybody could everybody's voice could be picked up as best they could as best they could now as i say they entered into a contract with the court the judge obviously had to sign off on the uh on the setup and it was today what we would consider to be selling the broadcast rights to the trial in addition to the microphones in the building they set up loudspeakers around the city of Dayton, so people who couldn't get into the courtroom could still listen to the proceedings. It's fed through the same mics. So there's loudspeakers set up all over the city, and as you can see, basically schoolyard, courthouse, and everything, and the judge kind of got into it. He's like, I'm going to be famous too, just like my town, just like Scopes, and he said my gavel will be heard around the room. Now, the thing that WGN did not do, and a lot of people have wondered why they didn't, is 
They didn't syndicate it. They didn't set up a network of any kind. It was only broadcast from their station, from their tower in Chicago, partly because they weren't sure it was going to work. And they didn't want to enter into contractual agreements with other stations if it was a failure. So there was no syndication of this at all. It was only broadcast on that station, only on that station. Now here, I've got a couple of photographs of the examples of the things that were set up for the electronics. So they're a little hard to see, but right there is the cable running through the system. That's the phone cable right there. These are, by the way, are the schoolboys that Scopes allegedly taught evolution to. Those that could remember. He was also the football coach. So these are all guys on the football team. He said, you guys are going to testify, right? And they said, no, right, Ken? They said, no, and they ran away. And he had to go get them and get them back here. But he was a football coach, so he had that kind of pull. Um, in this photograph, you can see the, one of the microphones right back here and another one right here. So there's two of the mics uh, you can see in this photograph. Now, neither Darrow nor Brian really understood this technology. They didn't know how a microphone worked. And if you ever watch any of the many remakes of the movie Inherit the Wind based on the trial, one of the things you'll note is that the Lawyers in the movie are playing to the microphones all the time. They're, they're right up at the microphones. They're very uh, vocally demonstrative. Didn't happen that way. These guys didn't know how the system worked. They didn't really even know what a microphone was, per se. And so they weren't playing to the microphones at all. It didn't happen like that. It didn't happen like that. But you can see the microphones around the room. And here's the microphone stand here with uh, the mic. Uh, cinched up on top of it as well. Here's another example of a couple of floor microphones. There were four of them, as I say, around. And, in the, and here's one right here. Again, another floor microphone. So four of them around the room. Now, it was a dry, much of Tennessee is a dry state. And I want you to imagine in a moment 200 journalists coming to a dry state. And the economic opportunities for certain segments of the society, that is to say, on a, on a less than retail level, to meet the needs of 200 journalists. It was a marketing opportunity for certain segments of society, shall we say. So Quinn, Quinn Ryan, who was the main uh, announcer, he was the only announcer for WGN, he narrated the scene, was, and this might be legendary, was overheard saying, remember what they say, always a live mic? That wasn't exactly as well understood then. So at some point he thought he was off the air and he said, is there any place around here a guy can get a drink? And he, of course, was still on the air then. Um, the trial went on only for a few hours a day, so it wasn't really the extended performance that you might think about, you know, eight to five or whatever. The, the actual circumstances of the trial were relatively short, so they didn't have to broadcast more than a couple hours at a shot, which was helpful, which was helpful both to the announcer, and here he is, dapper-looking fellow that he is, um, it was helpful to him. Now, Ryan is an interesting guy because if you grew up in Chicago and you were of a certain age, and my grandmother was from Chicago and was of that age, they knew Quinn Ryan. And they knew him because he was their main sports announcer. And he did the Cubs and the White Sox games. And they thought, well, if you can do sports, you can do courts. And that's what happened. So he was the play-by-play -play man. Um, the engineer was a fellow by the name of Paul Neal, and those two guys did it all themselves. When it broke, they had to fix it. When it wasn't working, they had to screw it back together, and there was always a live mic. Now, there were also two movie companies there, talking about other media, two movie companies doing newsreels. But what do we know about 1925 newsreels? No sound. 
free sound, right? So WGN did not think to record any of the trial. There's no live recording left at all of the case at all. They didn't think to record it. The two movie companies that were there have film of it, but of course it was not in the talkie period yet. That, that technology was not available. We were two years away from talkies, 1927. So the only evidence we have at the trial, other than the transcript of the court itself, is from a couple of newsreels with no sound. That's it. That's it. Now, as Ken mentioned, the jury's out for nine minutes. One of the things about the trials of the century that is a common thread to, through most but not all of the trials we've looked at is the jury deliberates not very much. They're in, they're out. Those of you old enough to remember the Simpson case remember that. Trials of the century tend to be open and shut as far as the jury is concerned. Very compressed deliberations. So this fits right in with that. Nine minutes is hardly enough time for them all to go to the can and come back and vote. Very brief, very brief. Um, WGN later claimed that their cost was about $10,000 to broadcast it, not including the bar bill. So it was about 20 grand probably. In today's $136,000, not very much, pennies, pennies compared to what they spend today, not very much at all. But you also need to understand that this is very early in the sponsorship period in American radio. It was WCBS in New York who only the year before ran the first radio ad, which became the way to pay for it. And the first radio ad, by the way, is 15 minutes long. It was for an apartment complex in Long Island that had been sitting empty. And the guy thought if he could come on the radio for 15 minutes and talk about it, and it was filled, bam, like that. Pretty soon, every ad's 15 minutes. Not like that now. Anyway, one of my favorite parts here is, as Ken had said, many times the judge, because of all the procedural emotions going on, the judge would take people and send them out into the lawn, in terms of the jury, and they'd debate it. But they left the microphones on, so they just walked out into the lawn and they listened to the procedural emotion that they weren't supposed to hear, along with everybody else. So that didn't really work out that well. But when they did go out in the lawn, they had facilities set up, outhouses dug in the back. And it was so handy for them because these are the outhouses. Because by the way, this is a complete presentation. Ken and I are sparing no expense. We're showing you the pictures of the bathrooms. That's how thorough this is. So you students here on extra credit better appreciate that, all right? Anyway, these are the outhouses set up. And there was a loudspeaker by the outhouse, so even when you were doing your business, you could still hear what was going on. And handily enough, the sign back here says, just as you enter the outhouse, read your Bible. Now, I'm not sure if that meant, like, while you're doing your business. Did they, or it's like the old Sears catalog used to be, you know, where it's sitting there next to you, and you get, like, the power tools. <laughs> there you go. You're good to go. I'm not sure if that's what they meant. That would be something for the theologians to discuss. Can you use Bibles for that purpose? Maybe I don't know. Anyway, so as I mentioned, any particular day, 100 to 200 journalists there. You can see um, everything is done by Western Union. So we're talking about Morse code and Western Union operators sending the stories via Morse code along, uh, along the lines. Um, 22 Western Union operators, the newspaper is paid by the word. Um, two million words wired total, 165,000 words a day. That's a lot. That's a lot via Morris code. Uh, still photographers were there, and that's where we got all these great pictures of the still cameras. Here's a picture of a still camera. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And what's it all mean? Well, Daryl versus Brian. I think Ken wasn't far off in that it became really about the lawyers more than anything else. And the press is used to this because what the press covers best is conflict. And this conflict could be attorney against attorney. It could be science against religion. These are simplified themes, but they're themes everybody can understand. And everybody did understand it. And so Scopes himself was amazed at the circus that this had brought. 
at his media trial of the century, and there's his quote. Five days after we're done, Brian's dead. He dies five days later. Now, if I'm the journalist, of course I say he died of a broken heart. Wouldn't be true. But probably something to do with the heat exhaustion and the stress of the trial wouldn't be an exaggeration. Who knows? He was not a young man, and he was not a healthy man. And in his name, the town starts a college. Right, Ken? Bryan College. Still there. Started in Brian's name for, for having the, uh, the uh, unluck to die five days after the trial was over. Christ above all, Brian College. Now, in terms of the media legacy, what we've got is a number of things. As I said, they play to the microphones in the movies, not so much there. You can see several remakes, George C. Scott, Brian Dennehy, Spencer Tracy, Jack Lemmon, and so on. But the significant result of this long term is Canon, is Canon 35. Canon 35 happens after the Lindbergh case, two years after the Lindbergh case, in which cameras of all kinds, radio equipment of all kinds, barred from the courtroom. That's the legacy of these early media trials. It was too much of a circus for the lawyers to be able to stand. Canon 35, and here's the text of it here, is the idea that cameras can't be allowed in the courtroom. And it's been a problem for media ever since, or at least until the 90s. Uh, the Supreme Court upholds Canon 35 in 1965. Those of you in the media law class will be covering this. And the Supreme Court overturns itself in 81. As the technology becomes quieter, all of a sudden the camera doesn't click, zzz, click, zzz, click, zzz. The cameras become quieter, less intrusive. So the courts start to give a little more leeway. So in the early 90s, there was a four-year period where test cases, as it were, media is allowed in, broadcast media is allowed in to see if it's going to work. Now this is all on a state-by-state -state basis. And now every state, all the 50 states, allow some level of cameras. Some level. But it varies by state. And we were talking earlier at supper about the old courtroom artists. And I used to, I was an AP reporter for a long time, covered courts. And in those days, the sketch artists would come in with the big notebooks and a million colored pencils and sit down in the front row and draw a picture of the defendant really fast. That's a dying art. And it was really fun to watch. Those people were really fun to watch. But <clears throat> that job is going away. Now. The Lindbergh case, the Lindbergh kidnapping case, was really the case that was the beginning of the end of any kind of inside broadcast, inside media coverage, and still pre-TV, remember, of uh, trials like this. That really spurs uh, uh, the canon, the, the ABA, to take action. But as I said, the trials of the century roll on as more media. We've got television after World War II and uh, so on. And so now we've got Alger Hiss, Chicago 7, Charlie Manson, uh, the Millet Massacre, and O.J. Simpson. So trials of the century continuing to come. You can think to yourself what was going to be the next one, because there will be another one. So thank you. We will now take questions. I think you all have cards, and uh, Gina and Paul, uh, our theology tutors, will be going up and down the aisles. And if you have a question or if you'd like to write one down, we'll pass it right on up to the speakers. So uh, we now have time for your questions, and we'll have uh, a reception in just a few minutes out, right outside in the foyer. Well, we've covered it like the dew covers the south. There's no questions. Completely thorough. How hot was it during the trial? <laughs> 
What was the temperature during the trial? Because there was no air conditioning, of course, in Dayton, Tennessee. Yeah, it was extremely hot. And you can see the pictures of the lawyers in shirt sleeves with no ties to understand how hot it was. For a gentleman not to wear a tie in 1925, it had to be awfully hot. And at the uh, door to the courthouse, the smell was really bad, right? Because everybody in there, most people had at that point not a passing acquaintance with like Anna Perspirant, for example. So there were misters set up at the door to the courthouse that had perfume in them. As you walked in, you got kind of a cloud of lilacs. Man, woman, child didn't matter. It cut down the smell a little bit, but not a lot. Your picture, the one that you and I both used, show uh, the absence of coat and tie. There was one exception, Dudley Field Malone. I would love to talk about him, but there's only so much time. Malone was a divorce lawyer in New York a Catholic, more or less, and uh, maybe the only one on the defense bench who had real theological commitment. He did not take off his coat. He wore his coat and his, his three-piece suit uh, every day of the trial until one day when he's ready to get his speech. And then the commenters comment on this. When he was getting ready to give a motion, he stood up and slowly took off his coat. So I suppose this shows in a certain way that the drama of a trial isn't entirely generated by those awful newsmen and their cameras, but uh, this was surely done for a certain effect, and it, uh, it had it, because everybody noticed that uh, he was dressed so such a uh, stylish way, and at a certain point took off the coat to do battle. He's the same when you quoted that line of, 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 of Brian, that this is a duel to the death. Mm -hmm. Brian had made that before the the trial and some old oh, public lecture given at a dinner they arranged mm -hmm. for him. Dudley Field Malone, when he was getting ready to make this speech, he stood up and he said, Your Honor, Mr. Bryan says this is a duel to, death, to the death. He said, I don't know anything about dueling. He says, it's against the law of Tennessee. It's against God's law. So, again, even when, maybe that was for the radio, but uh, in a certain sense, it was an audience that loved Oratory mm -hmm. and the the lawyers gave them the money's worth. We have a, a couple of questions coming in, and if you have any others, please write them down. Uh, first question: uh, the person writes, "I have no context of this trial's history. Why was it called the Monkey Trial?" So it's a little bit muffled. Oh, why was it called the monkey trail? Yeah, there was uh, the journalist who did that. Do you want to start off? Uh, no. Well, I can do it. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, so H.L. Mencken calls it the monkey trial. What had actually happened was Rappelier at his drugstore had found a, a believe it or not, a chimpanzee, uh, uh, unemployed chimpanzee, and dressed him in a uh, small child's suit and coat and tie. And the chimpanzee, of course, he was trying to get business into his drugstore. Uh, he had the chimpanzee walk up and down uh, the sidewalk in front of the drugstore with his suit and tie on as a way to draw attention to the, uh, to the drugstore. And I guess that would stick in your mind if you saw a chimpanzee walking down the street with a suit on. You might think of it. But there was the other, the evolutionary answer to that question as well. Yeah, it, um, I suppose the first answer would be this is just a kind of popular tag that uh, somebody uses to get, get a headline or get a short way to describe. That's how thing. we roll. And there's always, I think, a tension there between uh, several different matters. One is the, the ACLU's project of challenging a statute that they thought was... Uh, uh, was unconstitutional. So there's a straightforward legal thing that's going on. Uh, beyond that, there were some on both sides that wanted to have a big public uh, session on, on evolution, the critique and the case for it. Uh, this was, I mean, uh, Darrow, or sorry, William Jennings Bryan was a was a Chautauqua speaker. He did public speeches all the time, and and I think there were many on the other side also who wanted to lay out the case for uh, either for well before evolution and for the claim it didn't contradict the Bible. So there were people who wanted to do that. The judge said, "No, we're here to do legal business," and uh, 
and, and put, a, put a stop to it. Uh, and then there were people that just wanted to, to boost the image of the town. That could be done with a serious debate. But it could also be done with people coming in with their monkeys and so on. It drove business into the town, and the town was suffering economically. And uh, so I think the, the phrase monkey trial points to that third and the worst. As there's a legal question, and there's a bigger question about education policy and science, and then there's the kind of show stuff. And the show stuff sometimes took over. It got the better of Judge Ralston. Ralston should not have let Brian testify any more than he let any other person testify. But here was Darrow, and here was Brian. Darrow comes and says, I want to call Brian to the tan to testify on the Bible. And, and, and Brian's eager to do it. And uh, poor Tom Stewart, the state's attorney, kept saying, no, what's the point of this? But the judge, I suppose, wanted to hear it as much as anybody else. So he let it go on for a couple hours. Then he came to his senses overnight, and the next morning struck it all from, from the record. So there's but several the, the, different The judge wanted to know who Kane's Sorry. wife, the judge wanted to know who Kane's wife was, too. I think I, that was, I maybe. I suppose, I mean, I think all kinds of people were interested yeah. in the. The newspapers reported that all of a sudden in the, in the libraries all around Tennessee, there was a huge run on, on Origin of Species. Yeah. Everybody wanted to read it. So, you know, there were a lot of people who were just interested in hearing both sides. They didn't right. care about the legal thing as much as they cared about you know, just, you know, the general discussion of an interesting question. Right. And I, I've written six books. I beg somebody to ban one because it's really a guaranteed sales incentive. You know, everybody, if you ban it, all of a sudden everybody's going to read it. I haven't had that luck yet. So if anybody out there is like in a school board somewhere, you know, we can talk. So Pro Professor Kemp, at its most basic then, would the, would the idea of the monkey be that we are descended, that human beings are descended from monkeys and not created by God? Is that... that it, it's just... I'm going to let Ken I take this one, the, too. The, when I said, and I was, you know, didn't have time to elaborate on every kind of thought I had, that there's some complexity here. It's precisely here that the complexity lies. Let me show you one thing that I had here in case the question arose. If I get some. Let's look at the language of the Butler Act and then ask how it should be interpreted. Oops, I need to, which button? Okay, here's what the law said. It should be unlawful to teach any theory that denies the story of the divine creation of man as taught in the Bible and to teach instead that man has descended from a lower order of animals. Now, what could you, what could you not teach uh, under that law? Here I've articulated four different theses that uh, run a range. The syntactic order isn't ideal, but they're set up to show, you know, contrast with one another. How about this idea? Natural processes produce, without divine intervention or guidance, the first human beings from animal species. Or natural processes produce, guided by divine action, the first human beings from animal species. Or maybe just natural processes produce, guided by divine action, the bodies of the first human beings from animal species. Or maybe natural processes only played a significant role but didn't do everything. They were supplemented by divine action in creating even the bodies. Now, what exactly did the, the Butler Act prohibit? I think that uh, one judge in the Supreme Court who, who would have struck the law down for vagueness was right. It's not so clear. What do I think? Uh, I think A3. Uh, is, uh, well, it's, it depends on what you mean by exactly guided by divine action. Under divine providence, yes. Does it mean God's pushing it along? I don't think so. So my quick answer would be, I think, human bodies evolved by natural processes, but God creates every individual human soul. So uh, that, could you teach that in the schools? If you taught it too explicitly, it seems like you're bringing religion into the classroom. If you leave it out, it seems like you're not giving religion its due. That's what I meant when I said this is a lot more complex than the laws and public, current public discourse recognize. I think there are ways through it, but it uh, is it's complex. <laughs>
Okay, let's do a, a let's do a few questions now. What was the impact on teaching evolution in public schools after the trial? Was there any real effect on teaching? Uh, yeah, that's a complex question, and I have looked at it at some. Uh, evolutionary theory in general, evolution of man in particular, is just working its way into the uh, textbooks in the 1920s. Most of them try to make some kind of accommodation of uh, religious concerns without going in any great detail about evolution or, or theological matters. It diminishes somewhat over the following years. Only three states had laws prohibiting the teaching of evolution. Other states and jurisdictions sometimes uh, made an effort to look for textbooks that didn't talk about evolution, Texas, for example. So there's some diminution of the treatment of it. Some people just thought it was too complex to teach in, in, in high schools at all and didn't. I mean, even the uh, Hunter textbook, it mentions it on a few pages, but it's mostly concerned with other things. Picks up again in the 1950s, but how much is hard to tell because we get new textbooks then, and the textbooks advertise themselves. We're going to take up all these topics like evolution that were ignored before. Now, is that right or is that their own sales copy? It's... Uh, it's hard to exactly measure, uh, but there's some diminution, there's some increase on it. I've got some stuff written up on it, but it's all a matter of details. What does this textbook say and that one? And uh, the answer is they vary. I have a question here. What do you think of the current saturation of the, uh, the TV airwaves with trials like the Jody Arias trial, court TV, et cetera? Does it skew the administration of justice or serve the democracy of open courts? The uh, some of you might remember uh, Judge Wapner in the People's Court, and Judge Wapner's, uh, of course, was started in about 1981 or so, and it was actually the broadcast and the success of uh, the People's Court and Judge Wapner that led the ABA to soften its stance on uh, cameras in the courtroom. They saw that, in to a certain degree, that there was an educational purpose served by. The People's Court. Uh, it was highly, highly popular. It ran for 12 years uninterrupted with with the judge, who was actually a real judge, um, and it softened the uh, the ABA's position considerably on the idea of, of of cameras in the courtroom. And so I'm I'm of the belief that it's actually led to a better understanding by the public of how the courts actually work. Now um, the other the other sort of a uh, hint of a question here is uh, why are all these shows on the air now? Well, the obvious answer is they're very cheap to produce. Um, you don't have to pay anybody other than the judge and some technicians to broadcast it. And so you see the proliferation of these kinds of shows about court TV kinds and an entire network uh, because it's extremely inexpensive. It's ex inexpensive television. I have this question, uh, why do you say the popular image of the histor is historically inaccurate? What do you think the popular image was? Can you go back to that first cartoon that you made me put up there? Uh, where is that? Um, this was his idea. I said, wait a minute, that's what I'm arguing against. He said, good, there's your spoil. Uh, guilty. Guilty, this is a funny thing to say. I mean, in a technical sense, yeah. Scopes was convicted of violating the law. But guilty sounds like some kind of criminal trial are coming after him, as they do in Inherit the Wind, the film that, or play, that we all watch, the film that some history curricula recommend to their teachers to present what the 1920s uh, looked like on this issue. Uh, popular histories, I can quote some. I didn't bring my book, but maybe that's good, or I'll be reading forever, but I can show you some popular histories that present that view. Scopes was serious, minding his own business, trying to teach his kids a little bit of evolution, and in come those terrible fundamentalists and lock him in irons and convict him of a crime and stuff like that. That just wasn't what happened. 
Uh, he didn't even know whether he taught evolution. Remember what he said? Well, I guess I'll stand for you if you think you can convict me. I mean, if you think I even taught it. In other words, he was trying to test the law. And he agreed to, to stand. And the old-fashioned way of doing this is you go out and violate the law and they get yourself arrested. The idea of a declaratory judgment where the uh, court enjoins enforcement of the law was relatively new in 1925. I think they passed their law allowing that. But, you know, the guys in the uh, in the, the uh, drugstore in Dayton weren't thinking that way. And it's more dramatic to call up and say, this is uh, superintendent of schools. We've just arrested a man for teaching evolution. But, I mean, this wasn't a persecution of him. They were setting something up so that they could have a big trial of this legal case, to be minimalist, or to have this big discussion of an important issue, to be maximalist about it. That's what it, what it was, not, you know, uh, guilty. And so I think there are real uh, issues that need to be addressed uh, of the kind that I talked to about when I contrasted Brian and the ACLU. Uh, and I think that the rest of the cartoon, the speak not here, not see not, it's unfair. Look, I, I think that evolutionary theory is basically correct. I disagree with uh, the idea that it would be best to exclude it from the schools. The Brian Laws didn't go so far. They only put out of the schools the origin of the human being. And that, I think, is more complex. And it's a little harder to see how you're going to do that and keep clean of, of, of theology. At least I think we need to concede that in the popular image doesn't. It expands it as though it's a general prohibition on on evolution and an unreasonable one. I think that's wrong for reasons I said briefly here and that I go into in a, over the course of 50 pages in the book that I have written on this. So, But Professor Rolling said you may not read 50 pages. So uh, anyway. We're all thankful for that, Ken. But anyway, um, I have a Question here, uh, what was the economic effect of the trial on Dayton? Did the stunt work? Um, of course, there was a tremendous immediate economic effect for the 11 or 12 days that the trial was going on. Uh, 200 journalists drinking illegal moonshine, for one thing. Uh, staying in the hotels and, and uh, eating at the restaurants. Um, I think also, but the founding of the college can't really be overlooked. Uh, if the trial doesn't happen and Brian doesn't die, the college doesn't get founded. And one of the things that Dayton, Tennessee is now known for is Brian College. Uh, and it's a successful institution still. And so uh, in that sense, I think, I think the attention to the, uh, uh, to the community work. Now, of course, the Great Depression hits four years later, and everybody's in trouble at that point. Uh, but the college... Uh, doesn't come along right away. The college comes along after the Depression has already started. But I think that you have to look at the legacy of the trial for the town as being the legacy of the existence of the college. I've got a couple good questions here, but I, let me start with this one. So leaving aside dogmatic materialism and the evolution of humans in particular, what are the philosophical concerns raised by Catholics against evolution? Uh, not to say those are necessarily true, just worth considering. Uh, Catholic concerns are, are, are this, that um, uh, human being is different in kind from animals. Darwin's argument in The Descent of Man was that there's no way in which human beings are different in kind from animals, only in degree. Obviously, we're smarter in some sense. We solve more complex problems and we solve them faster and things like that. But there's no, it's only a matter of more and less. The standard Catholic position, at least standard in Catholic philosophy, and whether this is literally Catholic dogma or just the kind of standard Catholic way of doing things is more complex. The standard Catholic view is that man and animal are different in kind, not just degree. We're not just better at doing stuff they also do, which is the, the point that Darwin tries to argue in The Descent of Man. It justifies him in his mind extending the theory of evolution from plants and animals to human beings. But the Catholic view is they're different in kind because we have a power of, of reasoning. That doesn't just mean problem solving. It means having concepts, making judgments, and making arguments, showing some truths or reason to believe other truths. 
And then, so first, there's a difference in kind. Second claim, important to Catholic philosophy, is that the power to reason is not a power that can be carried out by a purely material being. That reasoning, the, the possession of concepts and not merely images, requires an immaterial component. And if it does, it can't be created by any kind of natural processes because they only get you from one natural, one material being to another. And so the two central ideas, human beings are different in kind because of their power of abstract reasoning and only a, a, a non-material being or being that has a non-material component can do such reasoning, can have such concepts. And therefore, evolution won't get you a human being, only the creation of a non-material soul, a direct act of God, not just for Adam or Adam and Eve, but for every human being on Catholic, and this is Catholic doctrine, that every human being is directly created by God. So if you think there's a problem uh, for evolution, you ought to think there's a problem for uh, for uh, uh, reproductive processes as well. They don't get you quite a human being, only the creation of the soul by God does. So that, in brief, is a kind of Catholic uh, uh, view on this and why I said, the question of the origin of man is much more complex. It requires more delicacy and finesse than most of the people involved in this debate uh, and involved in, in Tennessee were giving it. We'll do that one next time. All right, we have time for two brief, I think, uh, questions before we break for our, we can speak informally in, at the reception as well. Uh, Professor yeah, well, I think I'm done. Okay. Uh, Ken, do you have a? Do you have any more questions? Uh, another one uh, says, "Why not discuss actual science and religion topics involved?" Well, there are lots of things to discuss, and again, I wasn't allowed to read even 50 pages I have on this one, much less bring up all the other topics. We could have been here till I don't know next week sometime discussing if we discussed all the topics. So we decided this night to focus on history. That is to talk about this case. That is this. Uh, incident in history, what it happened, what it showed, what it didn't show. For those who want to talk about, can I make an advertisement? For those who want to talk about actual science and religion, I'll be back Wednesday night in, uh, not here, but in uh, John Roach Center Auditorium. Michael B. is coming out from Lehigh University, and um, I'm going to debate against him on the question of intelligent design. So then we'll be focused not on, sorry, not on human history, but history of life, uh, and then we'll take up the science and religion issues. Maybe you won't like what I say there any more than, than you liked what I said here, but uh, we'll get to it, because I think that's important also. It was just a matter of choosing a topic for the night. Well, then, let me thank each and every one of you for coming, and please join us, uh, join me in thanking our speakers. And please join us for some refreshments and conversations just outside. Now the lint is over. I didn't have anything to say. Oh, no.